In this video, I'm going to break down options trading for beginners, step by step. We're going to cover the absolute basics when it comes to options trading for beginners, as well as some more advanced option trading strategies. We're going to cover a ton today as we dive into option trading for beginners. So if you don't have time to watch this whole video and you'd rather get a quick summary or our cheat sheet version of what we're going to cover, you can click the button in the top right corner to download a copy or click the link in the description of this video. My name's Scott Bauer and I'm here to help you become a better options trader. Let's dive in. Trading options is like learning a foreign language, and there is so much new terminology that you really need to understand. And you've decided to embark on a journey that could potentially provide enormous financial rewards for the educated and the disciplined. While many investors are afraid to use options and think they're risky, options can be an extremely powerful tool in your trading arsenal. In fact, options are the most versatile financial instrument at your disposal. Options may appear complicated and difficult to master to the novice, but they're an indispensable tool for the professional traders that must generate positive income to pay their bills. By utilizing the power of options, you can potentially trade market direction with less exposure and significantly lower margin requirements. Generate income from stocks or instruments you already own. Hedge your existing market exposure and or tail risk potentially profit from changes in implied volatility, and potentially profit from nothing more than the passage of time. Now let's discuss some basic terminology. An option is a contract to buy or sell an underlying instrument. Owning stock options is not the same as owning shares of stock. If you own an option, you have the right, but not the obligation, to control your stock at a specified price, which is known as the strike price, until a specified time which is known as the expiration date. If an option is not exercised before the expiration date, it expires or just ceases to exist. There are two types of options, calls and puts. Call options give the owner the right to buy the underlying asset. Put options give the owner the right to sell the underlying asset. Owners of options have rights. Sellers of options have obligations. The strike price or exercise price is the price at which the underlying asset may be purchased or sold. Equity stock option prices are listed in increments of 50 cents, a dollar, two and a half dollars, five dollars, and even more, depending on the price level of the stock. The expiration date is the date the options expire. The last trading day of regular monthly equity options is the third Friday of the month, unless that Friday is a market holiday, in which case, the expiration is on Thursday, right before Friday. The actual expiration of that option contract is always the Saturday that follows the third Friday of the month. However, we now have options that expire weekly and even daily. There are many reasons to trade options versus stocks. Options offer an incredible amount of leverage. Option buyers can pay a small premium for market exposure as compared to the actual price of the asset to which it's attached. While buying stock does give you ownership in a company with the goal of selling those shares at a higher price, options do not give any ownership of a company. Investors can see large returns from even small favorable percentage moves in the underlying equity. Options allow you to control more assets for less money. Options offer the potential to deliver a higher percentage of return than stocks because options are cheaper than stocks and the percentage return is significantly higher. Options allow an investor to trade not only stock direction, but a period of time and movement on volatility as well. For example, let's say Apple is trading $143 and you want to own 100 shares of Apple if it dips down to 140. So if the stock decreases and you are able to buy the stock at 140, your cost would be $14,000. That's 140 times 100 shares. However, you could buy a 140 strike call in Apple for $3 when the stock is trading 140. This notional cost would only be $300, but still gives you the right to own Apple at $140. In addition, if you buy 100 shares of stock at Apple at 140, your total risk, let's say if Apple went to zero, is the entire $14,000. But 
your risk buying an option is only the amount you pay for that option, or in this case, $300. In summary, trading stock options, especially in today's volatile market, can offer investors the following advantages. Protection from a decline in the overall market or in the price of a long underlying security. The ability to purchase stock at a lower price or sell stock at a higher price. The ability to create additional income against a long or a short position and profit potential from a move in the price of a stock, regardless of direction. For those of you interested, I send out a daily watch list of the top option plays I'm looking at each and every day. So if you wanna dive more into the actual trade setups that I'm looking at, you'll find this very helpful. You can get on the list by clicking the link that should pop up in the top right corner of this video or click the link that we have in the description of this video. A call option gives the owner the right to buy stock at a certain price, which is known as the strike price or exercise price, up until a certain time in the future, which is known as the expiration date. Every call option comes with the right to turn that call option into owning stock. Now, if you have sold a call option, you don't have any rights. You have obligations. So owners of options have rights, sellers of options have obligations. So let's say I sell an Apple 150 strike call option and someone on the other end of the world buys it. Well, that person who has bought that call option, they have the right at any time up until the end of the lifespan of that option, which is the expiration date, to basically just turn that into their brokerage firm and receive stock at the strike price of $150. Well, since I am the seller of that call option, I am obligated to sell them that stock at $150. The reason people love trading options and the reason that people trade call options is because they think that a stock may increase in value. And the price of a call option is just a fraction of what actually buying the stock would be. There's a multiplier of 100, meaning if you see a price of a call option trading for, let's say, $1.50, if we take $1.50 times 100, the actual price of that call option is $150. On the other side of the ledger, we have put options. Remember, a call option allows the owner to buy stock at a certain price up to a certain time in the future. But a put option is the opposite. It allows the owner to sell stock at a certain price, which is also known as the strike or exercise price, up until a certain time in the future, which is the expiration date. So let's say you know we think a stock is going down. Let's uh, randomly take Tesla, all right? If we think the stock is going down to 110, okay, maybe I buy the 120 strike put option. That gives me the right to sell stock at 120. Now, what happens if I'm the seller of that put option? Well, remember, as we talked about when we were discussing call options, buyers of options, they have rights. Sellers have obligations. So in this instance with Tesla, I have the right to sell stock at $120 if I want to. The person that sold that put option somewhere else in the world, if I choose my right to sell stock at 120, they have the obligation to buy it from me at 120. What if the stock went to $150 and I sold it at 120? Well, I'm a loser of $30, right? Or 30 times 100 shares, $3,000. However, if I buy a put option that gives me the right to sell stock at 120, the only risk that I have, the maximum amount that I could potentially lose is what I pay for that put option, regardless of how high the stock goes. Call and put options are broken down into three categories, in the money, at the money, and out of the money. Let's focus on call options first. A call option is known to be in the money if the strike price of, or exercise price of that option is lower than where the stock is trading. For example, let's take NVIDIA. Let's say the stock is trading at $170. 
and I happen to own a $160 strike call, that call is known as in the money because I could turn that call into my brokerage firm, receive stock at 160 while the stock is really trading 170 in the open market. So that is known as being in the money. Now, for a put option, it's the opposite. Let's say again, NVIDIA trading at $170. If I own the $180 strike put, then that allows me to sell stock at $180 higher than where the stock is actually trading at $170. That is known as being in the money. Then we have at the money options for both calls and puts. At the money options are where the strike price or exercise price is right at or very close to where the stock is trading. So again, in NVIDIA, let's say the stock is trading $170. Well, the 170 call, the 170 put, would both be considered at the money because it's right near where that stock is trading. Even if we had strikes like the 169 or 171, and they're just a very, very small ways away from where the stock is trading, that is also considered at the money. At the money options have deltas of roughly 50. And that's because if you think about it, by the time we get to expiration, those options basically have a 50-50 chance of being higher or lower than the strike price. And finally, we have out of the money options for both call and put options. For a call option to be out of the money, the strike price or exercise price has to be above where the stock is trading. So again, with NVIDIA, say the stock is trading $170. If I own the 175 strike call, which allows me to turn that call into stock, I'm not going to exercise my option. I'm not going to take my right to turn that call option into my brokerage firm and have them give me stock at 175 when the stock is trading $170. That is known as out of the money. Then an out of the money put option would be when the strike or exercise price of that put is below where the stock is trading. So for example, let's say I own the 165 strike put in NVIDIA when the stock is trading 170. Again, by owning this option, I have the right to turn that option into stock, but why would I give that option, the 165 strike put option, to my brokerage firm, which allows me to sell stock at 165 when the stock is trading 170? So again, a put option is out of the money when the strike price is below where the stock is trading. Option prices are made up of two different values, intrinsic and extrinsic value. Let's focus on intrinsic value first. The intrinsic value of anything is what it's worth, right? Pick any commodity, any asset, any product that you may own. What is it really worth? Well, with options, what we have to consider when we're talking about intrinsic value is what would the value of that option be if we were at the end of the lifespan of that option or at expiration. So let's look at an example here. Let's look at Amazon. Let's say I own the 90 strike call and the stock is trading at 97 and a half. Okay, the intrinsic value of that option is really seven and a half dollars because if I were to exercise my right to buy stock at 90, I could sell it at $97.5 in the open market. So that intrinsic value is $7.5. On the put side, same sort of calculation, but again, let's say with Amazon, stock is trading $97.5, and I own the 100 strike put, which allows me to sell stock at 100. The intrinsic value, or the value of that put option at expiration, would be $2.50 because I get to sell stock at 100 and the stock is currently trading 97.50. That is the intrinsic value of the option. Now we're gonna go into the extrinsic value. The extrinsic value of an option is the amount of premium or the amount of what's known as 
time decay or time premium that is built in to the total price of an option. And every option has intrinsic and extrinsic value. We've already discussed what the intrinsic value is, but let's run through another example in Amazon. Let's say the stock again is trading 100 and I own the 95 strike call. Well, that call option may be trading for $6.25 right now. Well, the intrinsic value of that option, as we've discussed, would be $5. That's because that call gives me the right to buy stock at 95. It's trading $100 in the open market. That's the $5 value. But what about that extra $1.25? Because the option is currently trading $6.25 in the open market. That $1.25, or the amount that is over and above the intrinsic value, is known as the extrinsic value or time premium. That is the amount of, if you will, the VIG that is priced into an option. And that amount of extrinsic value or time premium changes with various amounts of inputs that go into option pricing. The longer there is till expiration, the more amount of time, the more amount of that time premium or extrinsic value is going to be priced in. The higher the implied volatility of the option, then the higher that amount of premium or extrinsic value is going to be. But at expiration, so when we get to the end of the lifespan of every option, every option is either worth zero if it's out of the money, and we discussed what out of the money was before, or it's worth its intrinsic value. There is no time premium no extrinsic value left in any option at expiration. So what happens to every option? As we've discussed, every option has a finite lifespan on it. It has an expiration. That expiration could be a day out, which daily options are so commonplace right now. It could be a week, it could be a month, it could be three years out, but every option does have a finite lifespan. So what happens to an option when we get to that expiration, when we get to the end of that lifespan? Well, that is what's known as exercise and assignment. So if you own an option, if you own a call option, if you own a put option, remember that gives you the right to turn that option into a stock position. That is what's known as exercising your right. So let's say we get to expiration and let's pick a stock, let's say AMD, okay? Let's say I own the 85 strike call on AMD and the stock is trading 88. If we are at expiration, I am going to exercise my right to give my clearing firm, my brokerage firm, my 85 strike call option, exercise it, and they're then going to give me stock at 85. That is what is known as exercise. On the flip side of that with puts, AMD again, let's say the stock is trading 88, I own the 90 strike put. Well, when the end of the lifespan of that put comes at expiration, I have the right to exercise that put option so I can sell stock at 90 when it's trading 88 in the open market. Assignment happens when you are short an option, when you have sold an option. And it's so important to remember that buyers of options have rights, sellers of options have obligations. So let's go right back to that AMD example that we just talked about. Stock was trading 88. Let's say I had sold the 85 strike call and now it's at expiration. What's going to happen is I will get what's known as assigned on that call option, meaning the other person in the world who I may have sold that call option to, they are going to exercise their right to buy stock at 85. I then will be assigned to deliver stock or to sell stock to that person at 85. I don't really want to do that because the stock is trading 88 in the open market. So I would need to do something either buy that call option back, cover it somehow, or I'm going to wind up with a short stock position at $85. Assignment can also happen on the put side. So let's say that I have sold the AMD 
90 strike put when the stock is trading 88. Well, we know at expiration, the value of that put is $2. So the person that I sold that put to somewhere in the world, they are going to exercise their right to sell stock at 90. Remember, as a seller of an option, I have no rights. I only have obligations. So I will be assigned on that put option, meaning I am obligated to buy stock at $90 from the person exercising their right to sell it there. So let's break down an option chain. An option chain, which is also known as an option matrix, is a listing of all available option contracts, both puts and calls, for a given security. It shows all put and call strike prices and pricing information for a single underlying asset within a given expiration period. The option quotes are listed in an easy to understand sequence. Traders can find an option premium by following the corresponding expiration dates and strike prices. Depending on the presentation of the data, bid ask quotes or mid quotes are also displayable within an option chain. Since you're going to see a lot of my trading layout today, if you'd like a link to get access to my layout so you can use it for yourself, leave a comment down below and I'll send that over to you. All right, everybody. So what we're looking at right here is the Thinkorswim platform and the option chain or the option matrix. Now, we discussed earlier different things that you can see on an option chain. And if I click to this screen right here where you just see option chain there, okay, you can see what it does is populate all of the expiration dates. So in Apple, we have expiration dates every week, at least for the first four to six weeks and then every month going out. And we've got expirations all the way from early February of 2023 all the way out to December of 2025. Now, if I want to just navigate to a particular expiration, all I've got to do is click on that expiration. So what I'm looking at right here, whoops, there we go. What I'm looking at right here are all of the options that are listed for the February 17th expiration. And what you'll see here is that all of the options from the lowest strike being $45 all the way up to, if I scroll down here, wow, Apple's got a lot of options, all the way up to 300. All of those options from $45 up to 300 are listed and tradable, even though there may not be you know, markets on them because you can see these far out of the money options are just no bid at a penny. Those are all listed. So now let's break down exactly what I show on my option chain. Okay, first thing to remember is calls are on the left side, puts are on the right side. That's always gonna be, I think you can have the ability to flip that, but on any platform you're gonna work on, it's always gonna be like that. So now what we do is just look and scroll through the different strikes. And what I have listed on my headings here, which are the most common headings, and you can really go through the settings and put anything you want on here, but starting left to right, this open interest, open INT, what that tells us, this column right here, is how many of that particular option is actually out there, have traded in the world, and are still not either closed out or not settled. So let's take a look at the, let's see, Apple's trading 146-ish. Let's look at the 146 call. So 1,477 of those calls are still active and working in the, in the market. On the put side, only 139 of those are open and working in the open market right now. So that's what open interest is. And open interest is a great kind of telltale, a great barometer 
for how active, how busy, how liquid the options may be in a particular stock. And we know that in, in Apple and, you know, many of the other big stocks like Microsoft, Boeing, NVIDIA, stocks like that, they're always going to have large open interest. But that is what open interest is. Okay, next column over. Right here, volume. Okay, volume shows us the amount of contracts traded on that trading day. Okay, so for instance, on the 150 line, 12,762 calls traded today, 758 puts traded today. So again, an indicator of liquidity, an indicator of how busy an option or a stock may be. Okay, next over. Next over, we have a couple of the Greeks that we follow very closely. First, we'll start with Delta. So the delta of call options, as we know, are all positive. So all of these numbers here represent a positive delta. So let's take a look at the 140 strike call. Okay, the 140 strike call, which is almost $6 in the money, the 140 being that whoever owns that, has the right to buy stock at 140, that's showing a delta of 72. Remember, deltas range between zero and 100. An option that has a delta closer to zero means it's really far out of the money, very unlikely that it will be converted to stock at expiration. An option with a delta closer to 100 means that option acts Closer and closer, like if it was stock, and a higher probability that that option will be turned into stock at expiration. So the delta of this 140 call we're looking at being 72, pretty far in the money. So that means for every $1 that Apple changes, the value of this option will change by 72 cents. So if Apple went up, $2, the value of this option would change by $1.44. Okay, now we can see the same delta listed on the put side. Put deltas are all negative. So you'll see all of these deltas here being negative because a put option allows you to sell stock. So let's look at that same 140 strike, but this time on the put side. And we can see that that delta is negative 29. So what that means is for every dollar that Apple moves, the value of this put option is going to change by 29 cents. Let's say the stock went down $2. The value of that put option would increase by 58 cents. Okay, so that's delta on the option chain. The next thing that I always, always have on my option chain that many don't have them as a default setting, but I think that you really, really need to have this in here is the Greek Vega. Vega represents volatility risk. The higher the Vega, the more sensitive that option is to volatility risk or a change in volatility. So let's look at the 150 strike options in Apple. What do you notice? What do you notice? Exact same Vega risk. So an option with the same strike, whether it's a call or a put, will have the same Vega risk. And in this case right here, this 13, that means for every one percentage point that the implied volatility moves in Apple, the value of that option will change by 13 cents. Okay, again, that represents 
a 13 cent change in the value of the option as volatility moves one percentage point. So then naturally the next column over right next to Vega, I want to see what the implied volatility is. Okay, which you can see both on the call and the put side. Implied volatility on those 150 strike calls, 31.39%. So with a Vega of 13, remember Vega is the implied volatility sensitivity, let's say that Apple options got a little bit more volatile. Implied volatility, let's say, went up three points, okay, to 34.39%, the value of this option would increase by 39 cents. That's three percentage points of implied vol times 13 cents Vega for a change of 39 cents. Okay, next column over. Mark, then bid, then ask. Okay, bid and ask is just where do people in the world, traders in the world, want to buy or sell a particular option. There's buyers in the world, there's sellers in the world. Remember, this is like an auction market, right? It's a negotiated market. So let's look at the put side. Let's look at the one, let's see, let's look at the 148 put. Okay, the 148 put. People in the world want to pay 555. People in the world want to sell it at 570. That's the bid and ask. Okay, the mark. Okay, here it is on the call side. Here it is on the put side. And these columns are all changeable if you want to stack them differently. The mark is very confusing for many traders. All the mark is, is the average between the bid and the offer or the bid and the ask. It doesn't mean that an option is trading at that price. All it means is that's the center, the average of the bid and the ask. And you can see here, the mark is 562 and a half. So I get this question every single day. One of our students, one of our traders will say, hey, the mark is $9 and I'm offered at $8.80. Why aren't I getting filled? Well, that's because the mark, again, is only the average or the midpoint between the bid and the offer. All right, so that is the option chain on Thinkorswim. And again, if I wanted to look at a different expiration, all I have to do is click right over here. It lists all of my options, and I can go to any option chain, any expiration I want. Uh, we're back on the Thinkorswim platform here, and I'm gonna show you how to enter in an order on the Thinkorswim platform. And there's lots of different shortcuts you can use, and I always suggest the best thing to do if you have a, a question, their help desk is fantastic. You can always contact the Thinkorswim help desk and they will help you. But if you're looking to trade just a single option, buying or selling just a single option, call put, doesn't matter. What you always want to do is right up here, make sure that spread tab right there is populated to single. If I Click on that, you'll see we get a drop down with all sorts of different types of spreads where things would automatically populate. But if you're just trading a single option, keep that on single. So let's say Apple here again. I want to buy a 150 strike call. Okay, scroll down to 150. To buy it, I need to click on the ask or the offer. And you can see immediately what happened was, as soon as I did that, I've got this order entry down here, okay? And what that shows is buying 
10 contracts and 10, that's because I have that set as my default. You can go in and set the default amount of contracts you want. Apple, February 17th expiration, 150 strike call. And what that did, the price here, it put in as the offer. Now, that is probably not the price that you want to buy it at. You may want to put in your own price. Remember, this is a negotiated market. So I would go in and change that. Maybe say, you know, I only want to pay 275 or 280 for that option. So all I have to do is click plus or minus here. I can also manually enter in a price. Okay. Next column over. Next column over allows me to put in a limit order, a market order, stop order, whatever it may be. Well, I rarely, rarely ever use market orders because if I send this as a market order, you can see what happened was the price disappeared. It's not telling me a price I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay whatever the market is, more than likely the offer. Okay, I don't want to be subjected to the market. I want to buy something at my price. So I will rarely, if ever, choose to use market. I will use limit. Okay, that means you will not pay more than what you put as your price here. Next column over, you have the option to choose a day order or GTC. GTC meaning good till canceled. The difference is the day order is an order that lasts literally this trading day. If you get filled, great. If you don't get filled at your price on your order, that order is going to expire. It's gone. It will not be there the next day. However, if you choose GTC, okay, let's say you don't care about what the market does the next day if you didn't get filled today. GTC, good till canceled. That market will stay in the system as soon as the market opens the following day. That'll become a live order again. And that'll remain a live order until one of two things happens. Either you get filled or you go in and cancel the order. That's the good till cancel. Okay. Next column over instructions. And you can give instructions and your choices are none, meaning, okay, it's just my regular order here. And I've got 10 in. If I get filled one at a time, two at a time, that's fine. Or I can choose AON. AON stands for all or none. So what you're instructing in this order to do is only get filled if you can buy all 10 of these at once. Okay. If you don't choose AON, you could buy them, you know, piecemeal one at a time. If you do choose all or none, that will only fill for you if you are able to buy all 10 at once. And then the final column here, this is an order routing to a certain exchange. And on Thinkorswim, if you click on that, you'll see you can send to any individual exchange, SIBO, Philly, Amex, ICE, whatever it may be. However, your best bet, no pun intended, is to keep this on best. Because what that does is that sends the order out to all exchanges and will get you the best available fill at the time. If you just isolate and just send your order to a specific exchange, let's say the SIBO, okay, that order is only going to the SIBO. So your price may be trading on one of the other exchanges, not the SIBO, but you're not going to get filled. Okay, so that's how I would enter a single option. And same thing, if I wanted to sell that option instead of buying that option, I would click on the bid. And now you can see that order populated as a sell order. All of these parameters are the same. And then once you've completed exactly what you want to do in here, your quantity, 
Make sure you have the right expiration and strike price. Make sure you have the right price you want to trade something at. Day order, your instructions. You hit confirm and send. Now, a lot of traders just want to fly through this and send their order. Don't be one of those traders. Take the extra couple of seconds and make sure that in your order description, this is exactly what you want to do. This is giving you the opportunity to double check your work, double check your order before you actually send it off into the market. Make sure you do that. And then I will just send it away. All right, guys, that's how you enter in a single order into Thinkorswim. Next up, I'm going to show you how to do a complex order using two or even three strikes in an order. If you'd like a link to get access to my layout so you can use it for yourself, leave a comment down below and I'll send that over to you. As we continue to go through these strategies today, if any of you have a topic or strategy that you want me to cover, leave a comment down below and we'll put it on the list to do next. Over my 30 plus years of doing this professionally, both trading on the floor of the SIBO and at the CME, and as an educator and helping thousands and thousands of students, I have learned that trading spreads is by far the best way to minimize risk and maximize profits. The reason I trade spreads is because I always know with 100% certainty what my maximum risk is in any trade that I make so I can also calculate my odds, my reward to risk on any position that I take. I will never be open-ended on my maximum risk. I would much rather trade that way and live to fight another day as most day traders and most professional traders would than have a position where you don't know what that open-ended risk might be. So let's say I'm bearish on a stock and I want to sell a call option. That's fine. You can sell a call option. Let, let's say, for example, let's take a stock like uh, Microsoft. Okay, the stock is trading $240 and I don't think the stock is going to get to $250. Well, I could certainly just sell a $250 call option, collect that premium, and then cross my fingers and hope that the stock doesn't go that high. But what happens if it does? What happens if there's a big market rally? What happens if Microsoft comes out and announces something and the stock explodes? Well, if I am short just a single naked call option, I have unlimited risk. The stock can theoretically go to infinity. I mean, maybe it goes to 280 or 300 or whatever it is, but I have unlimited risk. So the reason that I would trade a spread is even though I'm bearish and I don't think the stock is going to get to 250, I will sell that 250 strike call, but I will buy another call with a higher strike against it as a what if, locking in my potential maximum risk. So I might buy the 255 strike call or the 257 and a half strike call where if the worst happens and the stock goes higher and higher and higher, okay, I'm stopped out. I could have a loss, but I know exactly what that loss is going to be. Again, this is knowing what your maximum potential risk can be so we can figure out our reward to risk and where the opportunities are. A vertical spread is an option strategy involving buying one option and selling another option at the same time using different strike prices with the same underlying asset but with the same expiration. Vertical spreads can either be credits or debits and you can use either calls or puts. Think of an option chain on your platform. All the different strike prices are listed vertically. This spread is a reference as to how the strike prices are positioned one above the other, just like anything else that is vertical. We'll now discuss the four different types of vertical spreads, a long bull call, short bear call, long bear put, and short bull put. A bull call spread, or a bull call debit spread, is used when a trader believes a stock is going to move higher, but somewhat limited. Profits are limited to the width of the spread, less the debit amount paid for the spread, and losses are limited to the amount that you pay for the spread. 
Think of it as buying a call option because you think a stock is moving higher, but then selling a call option with a higher strike price because you don't believe the stock is going to move to that higher strike. Another way of thinking of this is that the call option you sell is reducing the premium or subsidizing the amount you're paying for the call option you buy. For example, let's say a trader believes that Apple will increase in value to 145 by March expiration, but not any higher. The trader can buy the 140 strike call and sell the 145 strike call to help pay for the purchase of the 140 call. The debit paid of $1.10 is the maximum possible loss because if the stock is below 140 at expiration, both options will be worthless. The break even price at expiration would be 141.10 because the 140 call option would be worth $1.10 and the 145 call would be worth zero. The maximum gain would happen if the stock was 145 or higher at expiration. At 145, the 140 call would be worth $5 and the 145 call would be worth zero. Even if the stock rallied, let's say, all the way up to 160 at expiration, the 140 call would be worth $20, the 145 call would be worth $15. In these scenarios, the value of the spread is $5 and the profit would be $5 less the amount paid of $1.10 or $3.90. A bear call spread or a bear call credit spread is used when a trader believes a stock will either not move higher to a certain point or when a trader expects a drop in the price of the stock. Profits are limited to the amount of credit received and this type of spread also has limited risk which is the difference between the width of the strikes less the credit received. The bottom line is that the purchase of the higher strike call is used to offset the risk of selling the lower strike call. For example, let's say a trader believes that Shopify will not go higher than $50 by February expiration. The trader would sell the 50 strike call and buy the 55 strike call for protection. The credit received is $1.60, which is the maximum profit on the trade and will happen if Shopify is $50 or lower at expiration. The break even at expiration is 5160 because the short 50 strike call would be worth $1.60 and the long 55 strike call would be worth zero. The maximum loss would be with the stock trading 55 or higher at expiration and is $3.40. This is because the spread would be worth $5, which is the difference between the two strikes. Even if the stock rallied all the way to 60, the spread is still worth $5 as the 50 call would be worth $10 and the 55 call would be worth $5. A bull put spread or a bull put credit spread is used when a trader believes a stock will either not move lower to a certain point or when a trader expects a rise in the price of the stock. Profits are limited to the amount of the credit received and this type of spread also has limited risk which is the difference between the width of the strikes less the credit received. The bottom line is that the purchase of the lower strike put is used to offset the risk of selling the higher strike put. For example, let's say a trader believes that Federal Express will not go lower than 180 by March expiration. The trader can sell the 180 strike put and buy the 175 strike put for protection. The credit received is $1.50, which is the maximum profit on the trade, and that'll happen if FedEx is 180 or above at expiration. The break-even price at expiration is $178.50 because the short 180 put would be worth $1.50 and the long 175 put would be worth zero. The maximum loss would occur if the stock is $175 or lower at expiration and that's $3.50. This is because the spread would be worth $5, the difference between the two strikes. Even if the stock declined, let's say, all the way to $160, the spread is still worth $5 as the 180 put would be worth 20 and the 175 put is worth 15. We're going to cover a ton today as we dive into option trading for beginners. So if you don't have time to watch this whole video and you'd rather get a quick summary or our cheat sheet version of what we're going to cover, you can click the button in the top right corner to download a copy or click the link in the description of this video. Now we're going to cover what's known as a butterfly strategy. Now, in, in option trading, 
there are lots of, I don't want to say silly names, but lots of names for different strategies that, you know, beginners and even people that have been trading for, for a while think that, oh man, I just, I can't understand that. I don't know what a butterfly is or an iron condor or something, but most strategies are really just when broken down the combination of very simple strategies. And we're going to go into the butterfly strategy right now. So a butterfly strategy is used if you have an opinion on where a stock is going, higher, lower, or maybe just even sitting still, and it is a very inexpensive way to take a position. Now, what a butterfly really is, is a combination of a long spread and a short spread. That's all it is. One long spread and one short spread with the strike in the middle being the same strike. Okay, I've got an Apple chart up on the screen right now. Okay, so let's just say with Apple right here trading 153. Okay, so it's right here. Let's say you think Apple's gonna make a run up to 165 and you want a really, really inexpensive way to play a run up to 165. Okay, well, here's what a butterfly would do for you. So let's go over to our option montage here. Okay, and here's all the layouts for calls on this side, puts on this side, and we've got March expiration here. So the way that you can play this is buy a bullish call spread. So buy either the 155 165 call spread, depending on how aggressive you want to get, or maybe buy the 160, 165 call spread. Okay, so right now you can see that I have that populated down at the bottom here. And we can do that, whoops, I had it one by two, one by one, for about $1.30. So if you were just bullish and all you wanted to do was you know take on a simple debit bullish vertical call spread you could do that for a dollar thirty okay so owning the 160 selling the 165 for a price of a dollar thirty your break even at expiration would be 160 plus what you pay or 161 30. But we're targeting 165. You think the stock is going to 165. If it does get there or higher, then this spread will max out at the difference between the strikes, the width between the strikes, which is $5, and your profit would be $3.70. Okay, so paying 130, you could make 370. Not too bad. What a butterfly does though, is it adds in an extra spread to reduce your overall cost of the position. So again, let's say you're targeting 165, okay? We still buy the 160, 165 spread, but to help reduce our debit, to help pay for buying that 160, 165 spread, what we could do is then sell a 165, 170 spread. And you do that always, always in a one to two to one ratio. So let me put that ratio down here. Okay, so what you're doing in a butterfly, again, you know, the name sounds complicated, but it's really not. What you have is a long 160, 165 call spread, and then a short 165, 170 call spread. So what you'll notice here is the width of the strikes is the same on both. It's $5 wide on the long part. It's $5 wide on the short part. And like I have this ratio here of one to two to one, you can see that it's buying one of the 160 calls Okay, we're selling a 165 
in the long part of the spread. We're also selling another 165 in the short part of the spread. And then to protect ourselves in case Apple really makes a big run up, we don't want to be naked short a call, we buy this 170 as our protection. So what you can see here is this can be done. This one by two by one spread can be done at a much less expensive price than just buying the regular uh, 160, 165 spread. So let's do this again. Let's buy one 160. We'll sell two of the 165s and we'll buy one 170. I now have this, as you can see down here, this butterfly position set up. And instead of paying $1.30, like the original call spread was, now that price has reduced dramatically. And here, that price, I would pay $0.57 cents or $0.58 cents for that. Now, what is the difference? Okay, well, the difference is obviously 57 or 58 cents versus paying 130. Our target, remember, our target was 165. In the first example of buying the 160, 165 spread, we had paid $1.30 with the maximum value being worth five bucks for a maximum potential profit of 370. In the butterfly, so the 160, 165, 170, we're paying 57 cents. If we go to the same spot, if we get to the targeted expiration at 165, okay, the spread is still going to be worth $5. However, your investment is far less and your profit on that would be $4.43. So a butterfly is really just, you pick a spot, you pick a target. Now we always do it based on expected move, which we're gonna talk about later, but you pick a target, you buy a spread, and you sell a spread with the short or in the middle being your target price. And you can do this for either a call or a put spread as well, if you think a stock is going down. Now. There's always, there's always, when you're trading options, a balance, a scale. So if there's a benefit to something, you have to realize there's also something on the other side that we're giving up. And in a butterfly position, what we're giving up is the ability to keep your profits if the stock keeps going higher. So for instance, in the original spread here, as long as the stock is 165 or higher at expiration, that spread is going to be worth $5. Even if Apple went to 200, that spread is going to be worth $5. However, with a butterfly, with a butterfly, the risk to a butterfly, and yes, it costs a lot less, but the risk to the butterfly is that you don't get to that center strike and that you go past all of the strikes. So what happens here? Okay, what happens here if we get to, let's say, 170 in the butterfly? Well, the long part of our spread, the 160, 165, still worth $5, but now all of a sudden, the short part of our spread, the 165, 160, or excuse me, 170, is also worth $5, but that's $5 against us. So the value of the butterfly becomes worthless. So that's the give back. That's the trade-off with uh, trading a butterfly is that you're somewhat looking to kind of, you know, pin the tail on the donkey, hit the bullseye. That's where that max value is. That's where you get a lot more bang for your buck. But if you go past all of the strikes, this does have the possibility of being worthless. So there's different ways of combining strikes to come up with different kinds of butterflies. The one that we just did was a one to two to one ratio, which a butterfly always is, 
buying one, selling two, buying one. But in this example, the difference between the strikes was what's known as symmetrical, meaning $5 wide on the long side, 160 to 165, $5 wide on the short side, 165 to 170, equivalent on both ends. We're also going to go through something that's known as a broken wing butterfly, same concept, one to two to one ratio, but we adjust those strikes a little bit. We'll get into that one next. So the regular butterfly again is a one to two to one ratio of the option strikes that you choose. We're now going to discuss what's known as a broken wing butterfly spread. Same concept, still a one to two to one ratio. However, whereas in the original butterfly, it was symmetrical. The difference between the strikes, same on the long side, same on the short side. But in a broken wing butterfly, we actually skew one of the sides so that the difference between the long and shorts are not the same. All right, let's take a look. All right, going back to Apple here, let's use the same thought process that we did before, okay? And let's target 165. In the butterfly example, what we did was look at possibly buying a 160, 165, 170 position. So buying one, selling two, buying one. And if you remember, that cost us about 57 cents. Okay, and as you can see, the difference between the long side and the short side, same. $5 wide on the long, $5 wide on the short. In a broken wing butterfly, we still target that same strike. So if you think that the stock is going to 165 at expiration, that is still your target. That's going to be the center. That's going to be the short. But what you're going to want to do is make the difference in the strikes not symmetrical. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I want to get a little bit more bullish position in this instance, meaning a little bit more delta with a little bit more protection, and I'll show you what I mean by protection in a moment, what we could do is still buy that same 160, 165 spread. Okay, so that's the exact same as we had looked at before. But now, rather than selling the 165, 170 spread, maybe we only sell the 165, 167 and a half spread. So what this does for us, it gives us a long $5 wide spread and just a short two and a half dollar wide spread. Okay, the benefit of this is if the stock continues to move higher beyond all the strikes, remember in the regular butterfly, if the stock went above 170, that butterfly was worthless. So even though we had a bullish position, if the stock moved too far, that position became worthless. Here, when you skew the strikes, when your long is wider than your short, if we go beyond all the strikes, we're still going to make money, okay? So that is the benefit, that's the protection. In this case, because we're using call options, that's the protection on the upside. And I'll show you the example here in a moment. Now, remember what I said about a butterfly. And in general, with options, if you're getting a benefit on one side, right? You're, you're getting something, you've gotta give something back. There's that balance, there's that scale. Okay, so what we're giving back in a broken wing butterfly is that it's going to cost us more money than a regular butterfly. So the benefit is that if the stock continues to move in our direction, even beyond all the strikes, we're still going to make money, but we're paying more for that. So let's take a look at how much this would cost us. Okay, so let's line up here our 160 165, 167 and a half. Remember before, that butterfly spread cost us 57 cents. Here, we can see this 
costs us 98 cents. Costs us more, but gives us that protection, in this case on the upside, if the stock keeps going higher and higher and higher. So let's put up here in the original butterfly, which was 160, 165, 170, same ratio, one by two by one, we had reviewed that if the stock went higher than 170, the position would be worth zero because the long spread would be worth $5 and the short spread would be worth $5. However, with the broken wing butterfly, which all broken wing means is it's not symmetrical, okay? We're still buying one of the 160s. We're still selling two of the 165s, but now we're buying one 167 and a half. So let's look at it. Let's compare what happens if the stock goes to the same thing, to 170, okay? Or in this case, the highest strike, 167 and a half or higher. We still make money. The reason being is our long spread is still worth five bucks. The difference between 160 and 165. But our short spread, in this case, is now only worth two and a half dollars. So the value of the broken wing uh, butterfly here is two and a half dollars. So the advantage of using a broken wing strategy is if you're a bit more confident in the direction of the move, you want to get that protection in case that move is greater than what you believe it was going to be. The downside to a broken wing butterfly is you're paying more. But in either instance of using, if you buy a butterfly or a broken wing, the maximum risk you have is 100% always defined to the amount of the debit that you pay. So that's you know a basic breakdown of the difference between a butterfly and a broken wing butterfly. And again, we could use put options if we wanted to, if we were bearish on a stock. But please remember everybody, when you're looking at names of different strategies, when you break them down like what we just did, these are really just combinations of basic spreads. All right, now we're gonna talk about something that is known as a calendar spread, or another name for a calendar spread is also a time spread. And the reason it's known as a calendar or time spread is because we're using options with two different expirations. So if you think of a, a regular debit or credit spread where the options have the same expiration, that's known as a vertical spread. So, you know, one option on top of the other within the same option chain or same expiration. Whereas a calendar or time spread is a horizontal spread where we're creating time. So let's take a deep dive in here and look to how we would do that and why we would do that. All right, so right here, I've got Tesla up on the screen. And let's say we think that Tesla is going to go to 190. Okay, but maybe not right away. Maybe it's going to work its way down to 190 over the next month or so. All right, so one strategy would be to potentially buy puts in Tesla. Well, if I think that this is going to happen over the next month, just kind of grinding its way down, rather than just buying, let's say, the March 190 puts here, Okay, with a price of roughly $9, so pretty expensive. Okay, creating a calendar spread or a time spread is buying the option you want to buy out in time. Okay, whether it's a day, a week, a month, six months. But what you do is sell the exact same strike option with a closer expiration date, a nearer term expiration date. And if you think of it, what you're really doing is you're subsidizing the cost of the option you're buying by selling one with a closer 
expiration date. You're reducing your overall debit. So in this instance, I want to go out, you know, four or five weeks here, and we buy the 190 put in Tesla because we think the stock's going down. But then maybe against that, again, when I say against, and this is to help reduce the amount of debit, I sell the same 190 strike put, but that expires in just a week or maybe two weeks. So now you can see my $9 or $9.20 cost I originally had has now reduced itself down to $5.40. So if I have this position on, okay, short, meaning I sold the Feb 24th, that's the expiration we're using here, 190 put, and buying the March 17th expiration, so three weeks later, 190 put, what I ideally want to happen is for the stock to move gradually towards 190 by the February expiration, which is the short option that we have. Because if you think of it, what happens? Well, at expiration, every option is either worth zero, because there's no premium left and it's worthless, or it turns into stock. Well, at 190 or higher, that option is going to be worthless. But at 190 or as close to 190 as possible, that option's still going to be worthless while our long option, the option that we bought, has its maximum value while the short option is worthless. So what happens in this case is, if we paid $5.40 for this spread right now, selling one, buying the other, well, come February 24th, if the stock was trading right around 190, this spread would be trading much, much higher. And I'll put up a, a P&L graph here in a moment. The ability that trading calendar spreads or time spreads also gives you is that it allows you to then manipulate the spread even further. You can roll out the spread if you want. You can eventually buy back the February position and sell out another option, maybe the next week or two weeks down the road. So I love... I absolutely love calendar spreads. If someone said to me, Scott, you can continue trading, but the only thing you can do, you can only trade one strategy moving forward, calendar spreads would ideally be what I want because it gives me so much flexibility. So what I've done on this P&L graph right here, everybody, is you can see I've adjusted the date here to expiration. You can see the P&L increases, 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 increases as the stock moves where? Right towards 190. And at expiration, that is ideal. And that's really the same, everybody, with any type of option strategy that you use. Ideally, if you're trading a spread, you want the stock to be at or as close to the short strike at expiration as possible because all of the premium that you collected by selling an option, your short option, that's going to get closer and closer and closer to zero while the value of your long option, the one that you bought, holds value or even increases in value. So again, I, I really prefer trading calendar spreads, whether put spread, call spread, when I'm looking at a move in a potential stock out in the future, because it allows me to subsidize the cost of the option that I'm buying out in time by selling one with less amount of time to it. All right, now we're going to talk about one of those other type of strategies, one of those other type of spreads that has a kind of a really odd name to it and may sound really confusing, but it's not. And this is called an iron 
condor. Now, many traders, many, you know, beginners may, may look at that and say, oh my God, this, you know, I can't do this. This is not for me. I, I will never understand what an iron condor is. But like what I've explained before is that all of these different types of spreads and strategies are really nothing more than just combinations of other strategies that you probably know. So an iron condor, all it is, is the combination of a call spread and a put spread. And either you sell an iron condor, meaning you are selling a call spread and selling a put spread at the same time, or you can buy an iron condor as well, where you are buying a call spread and buying a put spread at the same time. So let's take a look here and we'll, uh, we'll go through one in Boeing and see what the differences are and why you would do this. All right, everybody, so I've got a chart here of Boeing up on the screen, okay? And you can see that over the last month or so, there's been a pretty tight consolidation of this stock. Hasn't really moved out of this range very much, unlike over you know the past three, four months, and then prior to that where the stock was all over the place. So you, know, you may look at this and say, all right, we've got this pattern here, and it certainly looks like Boeing is going to stay in this range, how could we take advantage of that? How could you take advantage if Boeing is potentially going to stay in this range? And this range being roughly, let's call it 200 to 220. Okay, well, one way to take advantage of that is by selling an iron condor. Again, an iron condor is just the combination of either buying a call spread and a put spread or selling a call spread and a put spread. If I am looking for a stock to just remain range bound, trade within a range, I would sell an iron condor. If I'm looking for a really big explosive move in either direction, upside or downside, then I might buy an iron condor because you're looking for either one of those sides to, to really come into play and make your money. Now, typically, we are only sellers of iron condors because we want to collect the credit. So let's take a look here. Again, this range that we're identifying here is basically 200 to 220. So let's say we expect Boeing to stay in that range up until March expiration. Okay, well, let's take a look at the option chain and what we can do here, what the risks are, what the rewards are all that good stuff. So I'm gonna bring up March expiration in Boeing. And remember, 200 to 220 was our range, okay? Let's say I choose to sell a 200, 195 put spread on the downside. Now, if I sold that by itself, okay, if I sell that put spread by itself, I can collect about $1.20. By selling a put spread, what you're really doing is saying, all right, the stock is not gonna go lower than a certain point, or it's gonna move higher from here. Selling a put spread is a bullish type of position. In this case right here, by selling the 200 put, buying the 195 put, I can collect $1.20. That means at expiration, my break even, my break even at expiration would be my short strike of 200 less my dollar 20 credit or 198.80. So if I had just sold the put spread, I will make money at expiration of these options as long as the stock is 198.80 or higher. To add into that, okay, because we believe that this is going to be range bound, now let's look at selling a call spread on the upside to collect more premium. So remember, the range we were looking at was 200 to 220. So maybe I want to sell a 220, 225 call spread. Okay, so what that has done is you can see that has raised the entire credit, the amount of money that someone's going to be paying me, to roughly $2.70. So by selling 
the 200 195 put spread and also also selling the 220 225 call spread i can collect we'll call it two dollars and seventy cents okay what are my risks i know that i can make 270 and we're going to go through that in a moment of where the stock needs to me for me to keep that 270 always have to know what our risk is so any spread that you trade okay any vertical spread remember we talked about vertical spreads and horizontal spreads vertical spreads meaning that all the options are within the same month or the same expiration horizontal spreads are calendar spreads where the expirations are spread out over time in this iron condor right here these are all the same expiration we're looking at march expiration here so these are vertical spreads so in any vertical spread the maximum value okay the maximum value is the difference between the strikes so the maximum value of this put spread is five dollars the maximum value of this call spread is five dollars either one now if you think about it they both can't happen at once right the put spread can't be worth five dollars if the call spreads worth five dollars because if the put spreads worth five dollars that means the stock at expiration is 195 or below well if that's the case then the calls are worthless same thing on the upside if the call spread is worth five dollars at expiration meaning that the stock would have to be 225 or higher then the put side is worthless so the maximum value of this iron condor is five dollars well if that's the max value and i have already collected two dollars and seventy cents then even if the stock breaks out of the range that we thought it was going to stay in whether it goes down to 150 dollars or up to 250 dollars with the max value being five dollars the most i can lose from a risk standpoint is two dollars and thirty cents per iron condor again that's the maximum value of five dollars less the credit i've already received so 230 is my maximum risk i can make 270 i can lose 230. so we've now identified where i would lose that 230 and that would be either below 195 or above 225 but where does the stock have to go for me to keep that entire two dollars and seventy cents okay we look at the short strikes that we have we have two short strikes we have two long strikes remember we're short the 200 put long the 195 we are also short the 220 call and long the 225 so what we want to look at is where does the stock need to be for all of the options to be worth zero well that would be anywhere in between these two short strikes if the stock is 201 let's say the put spread on the downside is going to be worth zero obviously the call spread is going to be worth zero if the stock is as high as 219 the call spread is going to be worth zero and then obviously the put spread would be worth zero so iron condors specifically selling iron condors are a great tool if after you've done your analysis and your charting and all of that and you believe that a stock is going to be range bound or within a certain range over some period of time the opposite of that is if you think that for whatever reason the stock is going to make a huge move one direction or the other then you might be on the other side and buy that but again we are typically sellers of iron condors because we want to collect the premium but always keep in mind we are 100 percent risk defined so even if the worst case happens here and that worst case being that the stock goes below 195 or above 225 at expiration we know what our maximum risk is that maximum risk was the five dollar max value less our credit 
of two dollars and thirty cents. So that's a quick overview or a, a kind of a wrap up of what an iron condor is and why you shouldn't be afraid of the name and how you can trade it because again all it is is the combination of a call spread and a put spread. Now if you are interested in learning more about how you can use some of these strategies from today within your trading I have something great for you. Recently my team and I created these one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions to break down exactly how to use my methodology but in a personalized environment where we can go through your goals, your background, and more. This will be great for those of you who have questions and want to learn how to put my strategies to use. You can get access to this by clicking the button in the top right corner of this video or by clicking the link in the description of this video. Uh, we've gone through how to enter in a single option order. Now I want to show you how to enter in a spread order where we're using more than one option. So if we go back to the top here, Thinkorswim gives you these choices that we showed you before about the type of order you want to send, whether it's single or one of these other strategies. Now, it's a shortcut. I don't ever use it. The reason I don't use any of these is because if you click on the strategy that you want, it's not always going to give you the exact strikes that you might be using. So for instance, here's what populated for just a vertical spread, just a plain vertical spread in Apple for February expiration. But what populated is only these $5 increment strikes up to 100 then $1 all the way through as you can see but what if I wanted to do let's say a 145 149 spread that's not an option here so then I just have to go back and kind of re-enter everything so that's why I personally don't use this drop down here I always keep this on single now that may sound cumbersome but I'm going to show you a shortcut how to do this again let's say I want to buy the 145 149 call spread okay it's actually really simple all I'm going to do is click on the first option The first option I want to do is buying the 145 so I click on the offer there and you can see down here the 145 call populated now how do I get the 149 on here to make it a spread here is the shortcut hold down the control key hold down the control key on your keyboard okay and then click on the next option you want to populate so in our case we want to sell the 149 call so I'm gonna hold down that control key click on the bid and boom now you can see I've got this spread buying the 145 selling the 149 now I still would have to go through and make sure the amount of contracts I want is correct make sure the pricing I want is correct and then the other things like limit order day order good till cancel any sort of instruction that is the way that I use the order entry when I have multiple options I just find that easiest now you can do it for verticals you can also do it for if you're using different expirations let's say you're doing a calendar or a diagonal spread okay so let's say I want to sell the March 17th 130 put okay so I just Clicked on the bid of the March 17th, 130 put. You can see that populate down here. And let's say against that, I want to buy the April 130 put. Again, hold down the control key. That is the, the, the answer, the shortcut to adding in any option. Hold down that control key. Click on the offer of the 130 put and boom. I've got my calendar and it states that put spread now populated 
Again, make sure you go in, change your contracts, pricing, whatever it is you need to do. Now, you can enter in up to four different options on one order. So maybe you have a butterfly, which would be three different options, or maybe you have an iron condor or a strangle swap. You can enter in four different options. So let's go through if I wanted to sell, let's say, an iron condor in Apple. Okay. So let's say I want to sell the 140, 135 put spread. So what I did was I clicked on the bid of the 140 put, held down the control key, clicked on the offer of the 135 put. And for right now, that's what I have populated down here. Now I have to add in the call side. So what I'm going to do, scroll down to the strikes that I want. And let's say I want to sell the 155, 160 call spread in addition. Hold down that control key. Click on the bid of the 155, the offer of the 160, and boom. All four now listed. It lists this as an iron condor. As with the other orders, make sure your quantity is right, pricing, all the other good stuff that comes with it. So again, guys, using Thinkorswim, there's shortcuts like using the control key to add in extra options. Personally, I think that's the easiest way to go, but you can play around with it yourself and see what might fit your style the best. I just wanted to show you how I do it, what I think is the easiest. For those of you interested, I send out a daily watch list of the top option plays I'm looking at each and every day. So if you want to dive more into the actual trade setups that I'm looking at, you'll find this very helpful. You can get on the list by clicking the link that should pop up in the top right corner of this video or click the link that we have in the description of this video. Options are made up of different inputs and the price of an option changes over time, but what exactly makes those options change? What makes the price of those options change over time? Well, those are measured by the Greeks and the Greeks that we are going to focus on are Delta, Gamma, Theta, and Vega. So Delta, well, think about it. The Delta of anything, not just an option, but the Delta of anything is actually the rate of change. So when we're talking about option Delta, we're talking about the rate of change of the value of an option when the stock that it's tied to moves $1. All option deltas are between zero and 100. Call option deltas are positive. So a call option that is far out of the money, that is essentially worthless, is going to have a delta closer to zero. While a call option that is deeply in the money is going to act more like stock and have a delta closer to 100. So let's say I own a call option that has a 40 delta and the stock goes up $2. Well, if I own stock and the stock went up $2, 100 shares of stock, I would make $200. But the delta of an option, really think about it, is some percentage of owning the stock. So if I own a call option with 40 delta, that means as the stock moves $1, the price of that option is going to change by 40 cents. So if the stock moves up $2, 2 times 40, the value of that call option is going to change by 80 cents. That's going to be a plus for me. Now, let's say I own that same call option that has a 40 delta and the stock goes down $3. Well, because I own a call option, I make money if the stock goes up. If the stock goes down, I am going to lose in the value of that option. I'm going to lose the delta, 40 cents, times $3 because that was the move to the downside. I will lose $1.20. Now, put options, same thing. The, the deltas range from 0 to 100, but put option deltas are negative. And that's because if you think about it, if you own a put option, what does that allow you to do? That allows you the right to sell stock. So if I own a put option, I want to see the stock going down. So let's say I own a put option that has a 60 
delta, which is really a negative 60 delta. If the stock goes up by $4, well, that's not a good thing because I have negative delta. I'm going to lose 60 times that move of $4. I'm going to lose $2.40 or the value of my put option is going to decrease by $2.40. But let's say on the other hand, let's say the stock goes down by $7 and I own this 60 delta put option. Well, remember, it's a negative delta. So negative 60 times that move of $7 to the downside, that's a change of $4.20. That's going to be a positive for me. The value of that put option is going to increase by $4.20. One other thing to remember about Delta is that when an option gets to expiration, when an option gets to the end of its lifespan, that Delta is either going to be zero or a hundred. During the lifespan of an option, the delta is you know, somewhere in the middle. But at expiration, when the option no longer exists, if the option is out of the money, it's worthless, and it has a zero delta. If the option is in the money, remember what happens at expiration, that in the money option is going to turn into stock, thus the 100 delta on that option. Now let's talk about what the debt ceiling really is. There are many macroeconomic events that have a direct effect on the markets and potentially how we trade options. These can range from employment numbers, CPI, GDP, and housing information, just to name a very few. Elections and other government obstacles can also play a major role. One headline at the forefront of daily news is now the debt ceiling, but many people have no idea what it is or how it may affect the markets and trading. The goal of raising the debt ceiling is to let the government borrow to cover the gap between spending and taxes already approved by Congress. The intent was to make government borrowing easier, but as we know, it has now become a volatile political tool which can upend the markets. The debt ceiling was created in 1917 as a way for the government to finance World War I by selling bonds in different categories, making it easier for Congress to approve each bond separately. By World War II, Congress created the first debt limit in order to give the Treasury Department more room to issue bonds. Fast forward a few decades, and the disputes over raising the debt ceiling shut down the government in late 1995 and early 96, then again in 2013. Maybe surprisingly, the markets actually held in there, and historically, these shutdowns have largely been a non-event for the U.S. economy and the stock market. The last shutdown was at the end of 2018, and that was the 20th since 1976. Data shows that in the 12 months following the end of these shutdowns, the S&P 500 actually gained an average of 13%, and the market declined in the year following only twice. The fight in Congress is here yet again, and unless Congress votes to raise the debt ceiling, it may cause the U.S. government to default on debt payments for the first time ever, as well as stop other payments, including Social Security. In the past, Congress has avoided breaching the limits simply by raising it, but this time could be different. The last time the U.S. hit the debt ceiling was in 2011. Standard & Poor's downgraded the U.S. government's credit rating, and it rattled the markets. U.S. and global stocks sunk, and volatility skyrocketed. As we continue to go through these strategies today, if any of you have a topic or strategy that you want me to cover, leave a comment down below, and we'll put it on the list to do next. Option traders need to be aware of a rule called pattern day trading. The PDT designation is determined by FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Day trading is buying and selling a security on the same day, and pattern day trading is when you make four day trades within a five business day period, unless these trades are less than 6% of the total number of trades placed in that period. FINRA rules define a day trade as the buying and selling or the selling and buying of the same security on the same day in a margin account. This definition includes any security, including options. Exceptions to this rule include a long security or option position held overnight and sold the next day prior to any new purchase of the same security, and a short security or option position held overnight and purchased the next day prior to any new sale of the same security. 
Trading in a margin account allows you to borrow money against the value of your holdings, either to buy securities when you don't have enough cash on hand, or so that you can borrow securities to sell to other investors. To ensure that traders don't owe more money than they can repay if their trades move against them, FINRA requires traders to have at least $25,000 in equity value in their account for every day trade made on margin. For example, if you have $60,000 worth of stock with a $30,000 margin loan, you have $30,000 in equity. If your $60,000 portfolio drops more than $5,000, you have fallen below the FINRA threshold and your broker may restrict your trading activity until you've deposited enough money to return to the $25,000 minimum. But you don't have to trade on margin to be classified as a pattern day trader. Let's say your margin account holds $26,000 in cash. You can use the cash to buy stocks and sell them the same day four times in a five day period. Let's say each buy transaction is for $1,000 and each sell transaction is for $1,500. Your new cash account is now worth $28,000. If you were trading with a cash account instead of a margin account, you are not subject to day trading rules. But if you are trading with a margin account, even though you didn't use margin for the trades, you will be flagged as a pattern day trader. Additionally, you would not be able to withdraw more than $3,000 in your margin account as that would put you below the $25,000 minimum. Now, pattern day trading, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you must be aware of the regulations, the most significant one being that traders must follow the $25,000 minimum account balance. If you have enough value in your account that you don't need to worry about going under $25,000, great, you can place as many day trades as you like. If you don't have $25,000 in your account and you make four day trades in and out within a five day period, your account is going to be flagged. Using a cash account can alleviate this restriction. With a cash account, you deposit a certain amount of money into your account, which becomes your buying power to use each day. You can use this money to day trade and the funds will reset the following day. If you run out of buying power throughout the day, your ability to place new trades will be blocked you're only allowed to close open trades. Since most brokers settle new funds overnight, you'll see your new balance of buying power the following day. You should contact your broker to ensure what their cash settlement procedure is. Also, if you intend to trade spreads and not just simple options, you will need to maintain a margin account which allows these type of trades. Through my 30 plus years of professional trading experience as both a floor trader and an educator, I've identified three deadly sins of options trading and ways to keep your trading free from evil. Trading options, just like trading any other type of financial instrument, involves a number of potential pitfalls that can quickly drain your account. Knowing some of the possible traps that traders commonly fall into and how to avoid them can give you an edge in your trading and potentially give you more staying power in the markets. Sin number one, buying options and letting them expire worthless. This one's really a no-brainer. When you purchase an option, whether it's to hedge or play a market direction or to get long volatility, you still should draw a line in the sand. Just because your risk is limited on an options purchase to the premium paid does not mean you have to sacrifice that entire premium. Many novice option traders make this simple yet significant mistake. Because of the defined risk nature of long options, they consider it to be a set and forget type of trade and willingly lose all the money they paid for the option in many cases. Let's look at a quick example. Investor Sally believes the stock price of XYZ is about to rise. Stock XYZ currently trading at $60 a share. Sally doesn't want to buy the stock and decides to purchase the front month at the money $60 call for a premium of $3.50 or $350. Sally makes her purchase and watches as the days go by while XYZ trades sideways right around that $60 level. Sally's option now has four weeks until expiration. Two weeks after her purchase, with no real bullish market movement to speak of, Sally's $60 strike call has lost half its value and is now only worth $1.75 or $175. Obviously, Sally's market forecast was incorrect. Sally could take her loss at this point and move on to the next trade, or she can continue to hold the call option. 
Many novice option traders will hold the call until its value declines to zero. Don't be that trader. Decide how much room you're willing to give the trade and then stick to it. A simple rule of thumb is to cut losses once a long option has lost 50% of its value. Sin number two, buying deep out of the money options. Let's make this one easy to understand. Trades are trades and lottery tickets are lottery tickets. Many novice option traders believe they can possibly turn a profit by purchasing very cheap, deep out of the money options. Sure, do people win the lottery? Absolutely. Have you or I ever won it? Probably not. And to be clear, out of the money options may be very useful for trading directional moves or for volatility plays. You wanna make sure, however, that the options are not so far out of the money as to make the probability of the trade working almost non-existent. While deep out of the money options may represent less monetary risk because they have smaller premiums, these options also have a statistically significant low winning percentage. The underlying instrument would oftentimes have to make an extremely substantial move in price for these options to pay off, not to mention the fact that the power of time decay is always working against you. If you are going to trade, look for trades that have an edge to them. Look for positions that can potentially profit without an absurd move in the market. That $100 you might have spent on an S&P call that's 200 handles out of the money, well, that can buy a lot of lottery tickets. Sin number three, selling options when implied volatility is low. While option selling has the potential to provide an income stream, it also has the potential to drain your account with large losses, especially if you're selling naked options with unlimited market exposure. Many new option traders get this one wrong also. Options consist of many moving parts, and while market direction and time are important, implied volatility is a huge component of option values and pricing. Many professional option traders trade option volatility and nothing else. Just as with a stock, you wanna buy low and sell high, or sell high and buy low, the same goes for option volatility. When selling premium, you want to sell high, which is known as high IV or implied volatility, and buy low or low IV, low implied volatility. Many traders get caught in the trap of selling options that currently have low implied volatility, only to watch the options value explode as implied volatility increases. Implied volatility does revert to the mean, so only look for opportunities to sell options when implied volatility is on the high side. Conversely, if you're going to buy an option, you want to look for options that are currently on the low side for implied volatility. Sell high and buy low. Understanding volatility. Yes, every option trader needs to understand volatility. Volatility measures the amount that something, anything moves around in any given time period. Think of it in terms of your stress level. When things are hectic, out of sorts, maybe you just have a ton on your plate, your stress level rises, you become a bit more edgy or even a bit more volatile. Well, the same thing is true for volatility in the market and specifically with option volatility, which is known as implied volatility. When the market's just sailing along, as we saw for the most part from 2014 to 2020, overall volatility was extremely low. Investors weren't as concerned about drawdowns or market sell-offs, so they weren't necessarily looking for protection. But then, when something out of the ordinary happens, like at the start of COVID, and uncertainty hit the market, volatility spiked. Option prices are typically cheap when volatility is low and get more and more expensive as volatility rises. Just as you want to buy low and sell high with a stock, the same holds true for volatility. So what is this implied volatility thing? Implied volatility represents the expected volatility of a stock over the lifespan of that option. As expectations change, option premiums react appropriately. Implied volatility is directly influenced by the supply and demand of the underlying options and by the market's expectation of the share price's direction. As expectations rise or as the demand for an option increases, implied volatility also rises. Options that have high levels of implied volatility will result in higher priced option premiums. When volatility is high, option prices are high and therefore it's not the best time to buy options because when the volatility drops,
the option price is going to drop as well. Conversely, when volatility is low, option prices are low and therefore it is a good time to buy options, with the added benefit of the option price increasing if volatility increases. This happens because option volatility is always mean reverting, which means that volatility is always going to find its middle ground or normalize. Now, we don't always know exactly when that's going to happen, but it does. Keep in mind that a change in implied volatility only affects the amount of extrinsic value in an option, or the time premium. Also, options with strike prices that are near the money, or at the money, are most sensitive to shifts in volatility, while options either further in or out of the money are less sensitive to volatility changes. In addition, options with expiration dates further out in time have a higher degree of volatility risk than shorter dated options. Well, if you've made it this far, that is fantastic. Please like, comment, or subscribe. And if you want to dive in even further, you can visit us at prospertrading.com. Now, if you are interested in learning more about how you can use some of these strategies from today within your trading, I have something great for you. Recently, my team and I created these one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions to break down exactly how to use my methodology, but in a personalized environment where we can go through your goals, your background, and more. This will be great for those of you who have questions and want to learn how to put my strategies to use. You can get access to this by clicking the button in the top right corner of this video or by clicking the link in the description of this video.